Gamescom Game Developers Conference and now we're talking to one more person who's right here within the indie scene, an Indian within the indie scene. Yes, we're talking about independent game development and we are talking to Shailesh Prabhu who's uh, founded uh, Yellow Monkey Studios about six, seven years back, Shailesh. Yeah. Well, thank you for talking to us and taking out the time today. So, in an industry which is very, very young, particularly in the Indian context, six, seven years is, is a fairly long period of time. Uh, how do you look at your own journey and more importantly, uh, what lies ahead for you? I think, uh, yeah, six, seven, six years is a really long time. Uh, we, I actually didn't think we would make it this far, but we have somehow. <laughs> uh, in the initial years, we did a lot of uh, project work for other clients and we saw that it was actually not really worth it because it was a lot of stress and uh, not enough uh, you know, satisfaction. Uh, being a design heavy studio like me and my co-founder, we were both uh, game designers. So we wanted to do our own stuff, which is why you get into games. So we started, we completely stopped project work about three years back or two, two and a half so years would, back. That would be sort of outsourced work, yeah, work that yeah. you were doing for other, other clients, bigger game yeah. developers. Yeah. And uh, even then we did our own work, but it was staggered with other projects. Now we only do our own stuff. And so it's like a big step up for us to be able to survive doing mm -hmm. our own stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, Hubrix has helped with that. Like uh, it, it saw some decent amount of success. Which is your latest launch, yeah, right? Yeah, which is our last game. And it's this game is available on the, uh, the iOS store. It's available on Android as well, That's I right. believe. And on Amazon as well. Okay, okay. So what are the lessons? What are the learnings? Because there are so many different models that people are experimenting with, free-to-play games, games on social networking sites, and then, of course, games for which people pay, yep. uh, like Hubrix. Which is the model that you think works for you? For us, I think it's uh, premium games, paid games, simply because uh, for us, gaming is a... I mean, the games we create is a very... Um, it, it doesn't follow, um, you know, like... Uh, analytics or a very strong sense of oh, this is what we want to target it's more about oh this is a cool idea and let's see what people think about it because um, somewhere we do find an audience with everything we do and it's usually offbeat stuff innovative stuff so it's uh, difficult to sell such games I mean uh, make free-to-play games out of uh, such games and you know make money off them it's easier to just sell them to the niche even if it's small as opposed to, you know, just try and make it free to play, even though it's not free to play, and just ruin everything. So. so do you make these games because you like them and you're generally motivated by them? Or are these games a result of maybe some kind of market research where you think, oh, here is a potential and this is the kind of game nah. that, might, that might click? <laughs> yeah, I don't think we've done too much market research. Okay. Uh, but there is some basic knowledge, obviously. Like uh, before Hubrix, we, the idea with Hubrix was, uh, there was actually a lot of things. Uh, ever since I got into the games industry, there, I wanted to create one casual game that anybody can play and you know uh, something that's like a format and so for Hubrix and when we when we started off making Hubrix it was more about uh, let's make a game that can be made without an artist because we don't have an artist in the team so we need to make a game that was like Sudoku or Crossword or something like that which can be played on pen and paper as well so and developed with minimal absolutely minimal artwork so all those things combined and that was uh, how Ubrix came about. Some, uh, the game we made before that, it's just a thought, that was completely on a whim. Like we had a mechanic in mind and it was fun to play and people, saw, people when they were playing it, they were enjoying it. And we just thought of this cool concept and we kind of merged it and it was something different. So I think the motivation behind each game has been different. So, yeah, but it's not market research. Okay, all right. Are you happy with the kind of hits that have been coming in, the sales of the past two, three titles that you've published? Uh, so, it's constantly, uh, not only has our game quality been constantly getting better and better each time, but also our sales and our exposure has been getting better and better. And better. Like our first game, Finger Footy, didn't do very well at all. Um, our second game, is Just a Thought, did all right. It was featured uh, by Apple in some countries. Um, uh, and uh, we got about 10,000 downloads. Uh, a lot of them were free, but uh, I think around two or 3,000 paid downloads. And uh, then we won an award for the best original concept in Spain, which had a cash component. So we, could, we got some amount of money which we could use to make Hubrix over the next year. And uh, then Hubrix has done well. It was featured worldwide by Apple on the iTunes store. It was featured by Google. 
uh, we got a Metacritic score of um, 80, uh, 76, yeah, 76, okay. and uh, good reviews from sites and user reviews are very high. So, which is what I was exactly coming to. So, fine. I mean, an Indian developer makes uh, what he or she thinks that is a really great game, uh, but then the journey to the Google Store or to the iOS Store, and then being visible there, so people actually come and buy. What is it? What are the ingredients that are required for that success to actually happen? I think the only kind of promotion that works for uh, uh, paid games is uh, being featured by the store. So you have to make a great game and the editorial team of these uh, stores, they need to like it because only if they like it will they feature it mm -hmm. and that, that's the only uh, way it will happen. So the, the one thing you can do is try and engage users on a couple of uh, forums and things where, you know, uh, the editorial teams also keep an eye out for what's happening and what's coming. Mm -hmm. So if you make uh, noise at the right places, they will at least see it, and then they'll see how users are reacting to it. And uh, if they if they agree with what the users are saying and it's generally positive, then uh, yeah, it's mm -hmm. possible that you can get noticed by them. So um, why not uh, free to play? Because that that's probably you know big attraction, particularly for the yeah. Indian audiences. We love getting everything free. What are your thoughts on that side of gaming? I think uh, we are not making, uh, I mean, we are not targeting the Indian audience at all mm. because I don't really think that there's enough of a market here of people paying. Mm. Even in our free-to-play statistics, I don't see a lot of people actually converting uh, and paying. Uh, so Just in paying a, for higher levels or paying yeah, for merchandise yeah. or you know, collecting things on the go. Yeah, so I, I've not seen a lot of uh, Indian, even free-to-play gamers actually pay anything. So then uh, it makes it very hard. But that's not the reason why we don't make it. It's because the kind of games we make, uh, we don't want to pester users with, oh, buy something now, buy something else now. We just want them to pay and enjoy the game. That's it. OK. And then again, what's the take on uh, some of the social gaming concepts that have been doing the rounds? I mean, Facebook and the sort of games people are playing there. Do you see there as a lasting uh, sort of trend, will that give serious competition to the kind of games that are being featured on mobile or how does this play out? I think social games has changed already because uh, uh, I think when Zynga kind of was not doing too well uh, a couple, some time back, uh, then uh, I think, but by then the smartphone games uh, industry mm -hmm. had already like picked up uh, and now I think social is more of a addition to any game you make or at least some of the games people make, uh, as opposed to completely going to a social network to play a game. So I think social gaming has changed a bit already. Um, but I think uh, trends come and go. Mm -hmm. Good games are forever. So I mean, we've been playing games for 30 odd years and people still buy and play games. And trends are just something that keeps changing all the time. You can't follow sure. them. Sure, but you know, so there's of course mobile, which is so big right now. But do you think of the well, the, the big league, the, the Sony's, the Nintendo's, and the hardcore gaming stuff? Uh, is there a place for perhaps uh, the indie wave, the indigenous developers, to somehow contribute and play a part there as well? Of course, uh, I mean, in fact, globally, a lot of indies are already on uh, Microsoft and mm. Sony platforms and yeah. Nintendo platforms. So, yeah, globally it's already happened. I don't know when it will happen with Indian developers, but uh, hopefully soon. Mm -hmm. would, you, would you be sort of looking, would yeah. that be an ambition perhaps over a period of time? Actually, the first game we made uh, with Yellow Monkey was a game for the Nintendo DS, which is a portable uh, console. And that, uh, we got a Canadian publisher for that, but then they went bankrupt in the 2008 uh, economic slump. and. Uh, we couldn't complete the game and so we started making games for smartphones where we can publish it ourselves so we don't rely on anyone mm -hmm. and um, how is it different how is it different when you're trying to develop a game for a console uh, company vis-a-vis -vis, you know publishing your own game on one of the stores i think uh, with with consoles there's uh, obviously the added uh, not problem but the added steps of uh, you know uh, getting a dev kit getting certification from uh, the console owners like Sony, Nintendo. And then you need to purchase the dev kits, which are fairly expensive and uh, always have troubles in customs and stuff. So uh, it's like, but other than that, also the expectation of uh, people uh, with a console game is generally a little higher uh, as opposed to smartphone games. Mm -hmm. uh, may not necessarily be true, uh, but it's that's the general perception. Uh, and uh, so, 
typically the development times and uh, resources needed for the console game are a little higher. Sure, sure. So 2014, what lies ahead for Yellow Monkey? What do you see <laughs> in the next few months? We actually don't know. Like we were working on three different ideas. None of them have kind of panned out the way we wanted it to. So we're just fooling around with new prototypes and seeing what's fun, what's not fun. We are probably planning uh, kind of like an arcade mode, uh, an arcade version of Hubrix, which will be kind of um, fast paced as opposed to the slow puzzle nature of the game. And um, yeah, that's definitely most likely coming and uh, another new game that we are working on. But uh, it's not formed enough yet to say anything. So. All right, well, good luck with those uh, plans. Thanks. And thank you for talking to us. Thank you. Uh, thanks.